He is an acclaimed drummer, DJ producer, culinary entrepreneur, and co-founder of The Roots. Please join me in welcoming to Google New York, Amir Questlove Thompson. I, I never know if I'm allowed to clap for myself or not. You can totally. Yay me. Yay me. <laughs> we do it all the time. Yeah. Um, okay, so I Googled you. I obviously. love a room where everyone has their computers. Yeah. <laughs> They're all tweeting and... I would love to work here. We're hiring. Okay. I'll fill out an application. I feel like we could make that happen. Uh, what would you do here? Just search. <laughs> <laughs> Just answer search queries. Well, I don't know, after the Lego room, how does one keep a job with, where there's a Lego room? I don't know, it's a good question. I it's would fun, stay right? there forever. I, I don't yeah. think I would make it long here. <laughs> you probably would, actually, because that's part of what we do. Oh, uh, okay. It would work. Um, so I Googled you, obviously. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, there are over 1.6 million results that come up. That's scary. Yeah, there's, it's not as many as Kim Kardashian, though just so you know, if that makes you feel better or worse, I don't know. Thank but, goodness, thank goodness. Um, I thought we would just go through all of them one okay. by one. You've got nowhere to be. The show doesn't start for hours, I think you're, okay. I'm safe, yeah. So the first thing that came up is music, obviously. And you're seen as one of the most inspiring, influential people in music, having worked with everyone from D'Angelo to Eminem to Jay-Z. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering who's the most unlikely musical inspiration we'd find in your library? Um, most unlikely. Yeah. Something that might surprise me if you were to invite me over to look at your music collection. I don't know, because the thing is, I think that in the past 20 years, I've made a career out of doing the exact opposite of what was expected of me. So I would almost think that for me to do something normal or expected would be like the new shock. Like, just be like if Madonna just or, you know, did, did a non-controversial project or something. I don't know. Um, who would people be shocked that I'm Well, what's an with? unconventional place that you find music inspiration from? Or just inspiration in general? You have your fingers in so many different pots and what sort of drives it's, it, See, it's really hard for me because I don't treat music as like a separate entity. Like, oh, there's oxygen and there's work and there's food and oh, here's music. Like, music is just, it's so... You, it's so ubiquitous to me, it's, it's like blood flow. Like I can't do anything without sound. Um, you know, people that follow me on Google have been having a, a field day uh, watching me curse out Time Warner. <laughs> 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 and trying to court, court Fios at the same time because uh, there's been dead silence in my house for like the last four days and it's like, it's killing me that <laughs> you know, my cable's off. But um, I don't know. Uh, let's see. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm just discovering Tom T. Hall, uh, a, country singer, uh, a country singer from the 50s, 60s. Well, I mean, once you do something, it's forever. But his era was between, uh, between uh, the 50s and the 70s. Cool. I'll say that bluegrass is like the one area in which I'm not well versed in. So, um, because I'm known to do unorthodox things in my DJ set, you know, like my niche in, in DJing is the whole, oh my God, he actually played that? <laughs> so, um, I'm, I'm trying to search for a lot of bluegrass uh, and country music that's like between like 106 beats per minute and 120. So that way Is I can a lot in there? mix and match them and shock people. So probably in the next month or so. Like I absorb it first before I do it. I don't play a song blind. Like, okay, well, I think this works. Like I got to plan it and test it and make sure that it works first. So where do you buy your records or your CDs? Um, no, I, I still buy records. Uh, um, well, it, it, it's, it's kind of different for me now. Um, you know, in the beginning, there, there were a lot of mom and pop stores that I went to in Philadelphia. And then when you start touring, um, Mike D's the one, Mike D from the Beastie Boys, um, like my first adult four-figure 
record shopping spree purchase was due to like a a record store that he recommended to me in Portland. And at first I was like, Portland, Oregon? But then he taught he told me like the most unlikely cities are the best places to get, you know, because you know, they might not treasure it as, you know, you go to New York City, you're gonna pay uh three thousand dollars for like uh the original uh Beatles uh yesterday today forever where they had like the blood on the their smocks there there was a controversial Beatles cover like with them in butcher's outfits and headless dolls that's very expensive <laughs> um whereas you can go to you know Kalamazoo Michigan and the person might not know the value of it so you can get away with it so I mean so it's just the flight cost of getting there and then <laughs> well yeah I mean, the hunt. <laughs> it's all right. you get my point <laughs> um but now I'm mostly um I have a broker who will let me know when estates uh, have things for sale. So in other words, um, if a disgruntled wife wants to, uh, <laughs> no, like, I hate to say this, I hate to really generalize it like this, but seriously, like uh, jazz collections come from divorced women who like inherit everything and just want to get rid of the stuff. Um, a lot of my, uh, and again, this is like, it's, it's generalizing, but I mean, it's, it's, it's how it is. Like mothers whose sons have passed away untimely or whatever, like I'll inherit Why are these 800 hip hop records. What do you do with it? Or, you know, I've, I've had to purchase records from uh, club DJs from the 80s that might have to pay their hospital bills and you know, that type of depressing stories here. Yeah, it's, <laughs> Divorce, death. Yeah, it's like right now I'm, 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 I'm trying to, I, I guess the biggest record collection story now is um, a, a hero of mine, uh, Jay Dilla. Um, when he made his move to Los Angeles, uh, he just put all of his stuff in storage uh, he was from Detroit, Michigan, um, so he put his stuff in storage. But of course, um, now that he's gone and his bills were sort of neglected, uh, the owner of the the uh, warehouse or where his stuff was stored discovered that he had Jay Dilla's record collection. So um, I'm trying to. I don't. I don't want it sourced out and separated. I think that it should be put together. So I'm. I'm. I'm trying right now to bid the entire. 10,000 record collection. So, mm -hmm. so again, I, I just I, I buy people's collections that have had some sort of misfortune with it. I'll tell you a very interesting one I got. Um, Levi Stubbs, the, the, the late lead singer of uh, The Four Tops, his daughter just sold me his entire record collection. Whew, man, like he has like... Everything. Well, it, his is more historical because a lot of his stuff are... are <laughs> acetates from like old Motown sessions and things like that. Like it was like 18 boxes, only opened up three of them, but I'm sure like the rest of them have a lot of historical artifacts in it. So it. right now I'm sitting on like 70,000 records. Where do you store all this? Um, before I bought my first house, um, I, well, I'll just say that my business manager is probably one of the smartest people on earth. Um, you know, if, when, when, when my record collection was like kissing 20,000, it was in my house. And then uh, a friend of mine, Q-Tip, lost his entire 40,000 records and, and a lot of Tribe Called Quest artifacts in a, a fire in 1999. So that freaked me out because at this point, uh, when you were coming into my house, there was nothing but records. So you just hear the, the themes that Indiana Jones, da, 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 da. <laughs> like, and you were like trying to jump over, like trying to figure out ways to not crush records because they were just everywhere. Um, so I built my my fantasy, my my version of the Library of Congress uh, room. It's like you know, I, I told him like you know, cherry wood floors and sliding ladders, and it's cataloged and it's it's beautiful. But now it's in Philadelphia, and I'm here, so. Um, I got to figure out what my next move is going to be, like how to transfer that up up to New York. Right. 
Well, sorry for that long answer. No, it's pretty. We got to go. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, enjoy the chicken. Thank you. It's speaking of the chicken. So people have been wondering why is Questlove coming in under the, the guise of the chef? I know, like Google. people. <laughs> I know. Like, what? Who's head scratching? Like, <laughs> bro? Yeah. <laughs> that was the sound they made, actually. So explain that road from the Grammys to the kitchen. How did that happen? Um, I guess the short story is that. Uh, um, Doing 200 shows a night um, with The Roots means doing an additional 200 DJ gigs, 200 shows a night. It's <laughs> a lot of shows. Yeah, we all... We weren't going to correct you. Thank you. <laughs> but that dismays me that you guys weren't going to correct me. <laughs> um, doing 200 shows a year um, also means that I have to do 200 DJ gigs a year. And... I've I noticed that in the, the northwestern part of the United States, Seattle, Portland, Utah, um, those places have very interesting uh, presentation setups. Sort of like how you guys have the truck inside your um, your cafeteria. Um, I'll say that like food truck culture, which is a very big thing in Philadelphia, uh, really hit its creative. At least in my eyes, it's it's stride in like 2002, where, you know, two in the morning, these guys were selling any and everything. Like the first time I ever saw an all grilled cheese chuck was outside of a DJ gig in Portland, and then um, one guy had a real specialty truck. It was like it was nothing but corn, and I thought. No, but people were lined up like it was. They're all drunk. It was like he was, <laughs> like, it was like he was from the fifties. Like here, 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 get your corn, get your corn, get your corn. And I was like, what the hell is he selling? But he sold like a vast array of corn. So cut to like me and, and me. No, it, one was dipped in honey. One was honey Mexican corn? corn. Yo, the it was honey. <laughs> it was dipped in honey and then coconut. Like it. That sounds it absolutely like disgusting. I'm not chocolate gonna... covered. Chocolate like, covered corn. Wait, where's Daryl at? Shut up, man. That's my trainer. <laughs> That's his trainer who's here. He's not happy about the chocolate cover. Anyway. <laughs> no, it was just like, it was really creative how they did it. And um, I always wanted to have, like, my soul food version of, like, a Mr. Softy's truck. Like, yeah. back then I thought, okay, I'm going to have a thing called soul, soul on a roll. <laughs> and... Um, you know, but I, I couldn't execute half of these ideas I had because we had to commit to, you know, 200 nights. Like, when you're only in your hometown for three months out the year, um, there's really no stability, not domestically or anything. So once, once the Jimmy Fallon show came along and offered us uh, normalcy for the, like, we started The Roots as 19 and 20-year-olds. Now we're 40. So imagine just going from high school and then now is the second year that I know what normal life is like, or at least a semblance of what, like an everyday routine. Like, so this is very new to me. So I feel like I'm that 20 year older that's dreaming about, oh, let me try this and let me, I just want to try new ideas out. So I guess with the drumstick, that was the most obvious uh, choice to develop it. Um, we developed it, I guess, for like a year, having a lot of taste tests. I, I put it out on Twitter that I was looking for a chef, and I guess people assumed that I just wanted a personal, right. like I have some sort of kingdom. And <laughs> <laughs> um, so a lot of people submitted, like over 900 people submitted videos, and, uh, and then we somehow managed to uh, do a lot of focus groups and taste tests and contests and not contests, but just, you know, try it out a bunch of dishes. And then um, we were finally satisfied, I guess, a year later enough to start our venture. And, uh, you know, this is a very slow. I don't I don't believe in that whole skipping the bank line and just, you know, instantly going to Boardwalk and Park Place like without having to go through. Oriental Avenue and Virginia <laughs> States and Marvin's Gardens. Like, I want to slowly travel it. So, you know, you, you start with the blogosphere first and then you cook for other chefs and then you come to places like Google and other conglomerates and then you slowly b build your way up. 
And so this well, I was is, telling you, um, the James Beard Awards were just announced last night. And I have to say, we've done a pretty good job curating Chefs at Google, if I might say so mm -hmm. myself, because like half the people that we've had in the past year were winners last night. So no pressure. Who won last night? Hugh Atchison. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Daniel Hum was outstanding chef. Wow. So no pressure, but. No, it's no pressure. It's within your reach. I mean, I mean the fact where, you know, a, a, a renowned seven time James <laughs> Beard award winning chef tries to challenge me like he's an MC. Yeah, so let's talk about that. How did that. <laughs> What, how I took that, that as an honor. That David was like, Chang challenged him. To yeah, David Chang. Battle. At first, you know, I thought, oh, that, that Chang, he's, he's cute. <laughs> you know, but then it was like everyone kept asking, like, yo, why is Chang picking on you? Like, I mean, we just, we created such a, a buzz, and I guess that people are just, I don't know, maybe the best way in, to go through life is to be, I love being underestimated, you know. Um, and I guess that his thoughts were just like, okay, really, like, you know, I'm tired of hearing people rave about your food or whatever. And, you know, so then I was forced to just say, bring it on. So um, my show got involved by staging a battle. <laughs> I'm being very diplomatic now. You feel like it was rigged a little bit? No comment. Um, <laughs> He was nervous, though. Um, yeah, and so he, uh, he really put a lot of preparation into it. So, I mean, the fact that, I mean, in a way, I'm glad I, uh, I'm glad I kind of lost because I think that if news got out that, you know, a drummer from West Philly beats a seven-time <laughs> James Beard award-winning chef, then, you know. The, the, just kill an industry. The, yeah, the, the world would have been, I think every chef would have, nobody would have touched me. So, uh, no, I consider it an honor. And, you know, he's a friend and, and I, I believe that. Alexis, when when does it go into a... Yeah, um, he's agreed to serve uh, the drumsticks at uh, Mama Fuku on May 20th. On May 20th, in case you didn't get one here. Yeah. Um, so we're at a tech company, obviously, mm -hmm. and I would love to know what's the most profound way that technology has changed your life? Like if you were starting out, if the roots were starting today. You, you know something? Be different. I, I will honestly say that we were the last, I believe, I honestly believe that we were the last group to really get on the caboose of what the old standard was. Because I, I think that, you know, back then there was, there was visions of technology and you know, remember there was talk of the super information highway and that type of stuff. Like we came right in on the caboose, which was, uh, you know, in, in, well, I guess the world knew of us in 94. I mean, we started in 92, but the world became aware of us in 94. But um, I too wonder what would happen because I think the thing that made us work hard and made us so resilient was the fact that there was absolutely no outlets. Um, we, uh, what's, what's the term that uh, English people use when you play on the, busking. We were busking on, well, uh, the term busking is when you put the shoe box on the street and you play on buckets and you know people throw money in there. Um, that's the route that we went to. Now, if we started 20 years later, we would have just made a whole bunch of YouTube videos. I don't think we would have worked as hard if we had the, the technology that's available to us today. So I'm almost glad that we came right before um, the technology age really started to, to, to grow. Because um, you know, a lot of people always ask, well, how are you able to work at Fallon and produce this record and score this film and do these shoes and now fried chicken and da 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 da, like all these things. Um, there's just a work ethic that we've had, like a sink or swim thing, that I don't think we would have had had we grown up in the technology era. So now, but it's helped us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you are one of the most prolific tweeters, as many of us know who do follow you. Thank you. Um, why is connecting to your audience through social media in that way is so important to you? 
I don't know why that's a funny question. <laughs> no, well, because, you know, this is, this is the point of the day where I, you know, I take the pen and take the balloon <laughs> and deflate it. You know, because people ask, well, how do you tweet so much? And da 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 First of all, I mean, tweeting is just a, it's just a, it's just a running dialogue. And it, it takes me literally 10 seconds to get a thought out. I think people think it's some rocket science thing where it's like, okay, I have to sit and take, you know, take an hour out to think of something. But, you know, I can easily, you know, drum on, I, all the time at Fallon, uh, yesterday when the Beach Boys were on. I mean, I was playing music. And tweeting. <laughs> and, and tweeting at the same time. Um, I don't know, I, I just see it as ongoing communication. I mean, it started with, my, when, when I developed uh, our, our website, okplayer.com, um, I wanted, I noticed that no one in hip hop was really, with the exception of, with the exception of the Beastie Boys, sometimes with, 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 at, on Hole's website, uh, Courtney Love's group, Hole, um, and maybe with REM's website, I'll say in the mid, uh, in the late 90s, those, those are like the only artists that I saw of, of kind of above the radar that were actively communicating with their fan base. Um, you know, and then the artists that I really loved, you know, like A Tribe Called Quest, I mean, the only personal thing you knew about them was like Q-Tip's favorite spaghetti recipe. Or, you know, Lauren Hill loves Jamaican food, man. Like, that was on her website. <laughs> Yes, and the word M-O-N was in there, like, mon. <laughs> you know, so back in 98, I, just, I wanted to revolutionize the, the, or think I was revolutionizing the, the, that velvet rope and cutting it. Um, so maybe like the first year of that website, you know, you, you had to get over the, the whole novelty of like, oh my God, this is really you, Quest Lovin. <laughs> That type of thing. So after doing OK Player for 12 years, in which I've absolutely spilled everything, like there's no need to write a book. Like you just have to go to the history of all my postings on that website. Something like Twitter comes along, it just forces you to give concise answers as opposed to long, drawn out answers like I'm doing right now <laughs> to you. So, um, can you compose a tweet for me about the last meal you had? Shut up, Daryl. <laughs> <laughs> I had salad in tweet. <laughs> okay, so can we do a word association? Sure. All right, I just want you to tell me whatever comes to mind when I say the following words. You ready? <laughs> I haven't even started yet. All right, food trucks. The future. Prince. God. Cupcakes. Daryl. <laughs> Jimmy Fallon. Genuine. A little nervous too, right? A little sweaty. No, he. No? he I'm just kidding. I'm totally messing with you. I'm um, chicken. That was that was first year, Jimmy. Now now he's <laughs> cool totally as a cucumber. Chicken. chicken. Hmm. Uh, okay. Profit. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> David Chang. Revenge. <laughs> All right. Just a couple more questions for you, then we're going to open up to Q&A. Sure. If you could request any Google Doodle, what would it be? Um, my, I've, I've been stalking Google to do a commemorative Soul Train doodle for the longest. Um, well, I, I don't know. People that follow me on Twitter know that I'm religious with Google doodles because, I don't know, it's just fun. And, you know, it's, it's like looking at a puzzle and I'm trying to figure out, okay, like how is it amalgamated inside the O and the O and then where's the L and then, you know, I, I enjoy it uh, a lot. Like when I wake up, that's the first thing I look to see if anything has happened. <laughs> There's a new one every day. I'm a here. geek. I'm sorry. Um, 
Yeah, so that that would be that's my favorite. And now that it's interactive more than ever, um, I've been uh, tweeting profusely about a Soul Train Doodle. Okay, well, I don't have a Soul Train Doodle for you. However, uh, when the team out in California found out, look at that smile, when they found out that you were coming, uh, one of our doodlers is a huge fan, Ryan Gurmick, and it happens to be his birthday today, by coincidence, Everybody. and he's on VC somewhere, hopefully. Hi, Ryan. And um, he sent a little present over for you. This is so awesome, man. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> like, this, this is everything I love in this one thing. Like, I'm wearing a Prince t-shirt, I'm playing drums. I have a drumstick in one hand and a Lego heart, and I'm holding uh, the letter L. That, that is awesome. You like it? It's pretty good, Wait, right? Wait, can I tweet that? You can, you can tweet it. Thank you. We're, we're going to move on to the next question, because I know you have to I can. Uh, yes, can I, can, I, and, I can tweet and talk to you at the same time. All right, time. so <laughs> you can tweet and talk. Um, so you told me earlier that the last thing you searched for was Bruce Almighty. There's a story there, and we'll explain it at some point. But... Uh, I was wondering if you could slow down the search results for me. <laughs> no pressure. I'm going to look it up right now. Okay, you're going to look up Bruce Almighty. Bruce Almighty. Mm -hmm. Bear with me. We're going to do this while you tweet. If I have a cell signal. All right, you ready? Yes. Are you still tweeting? Or do you we get? Do we? No, I, I sent twelve out already. <laughs> during during the talk. <laughs> yeah. You're just doing it in your pocket. All right, you ready? Is the mic here? Okay. Okay. Bruce Almighty, 2003, IMDB. Okay. Wait, can we get more ambience? Can we turn oh, yeah, the mic down? Oh, yeah, do we have down? beat? We need, we need mood lighting? Do we have any music? Any slow music? <laughs> Shut up, Daryl. Are we, are we throwing down a beat? Wait, they turned down all the lights. They turned the lights there. over there. <laughs> <laughs> we can't. Okay, this is already all a right. fail. Okay. Okay, we're going to start again. We're going to do it again. Okay. You ready? I'm Bruce ready. Almighty, 2003, IMDb. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she loves Jimmy Carey. <laughs> this is going to be a fail. Bruce Almighty, Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia. She's trusting it enough to go to an unreliable source of encyclopedia. <laughs> Wait, can I just say that I don't agree that Wikipedia is all that revisionist? <laughs> anyway. Images for Bruce Almighty. I forgot why I searched Bruce Almighty. This we, were, we were talking about um, Bill Gates being the Moses of, the, of Silicon Valley. It was a, All right, we just got super non sequitur now. We really okay. did. And then he went into Bruce Almighty. I don't know why. I, I just went with it. Bruce Almighty, Rotten Tomatoes. Can we talk about Bruce Almighty too? Yeah, go for it. Such a shame, baby, that you only got a 27 rating. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you. You're a good sport. Steve right. Carell has no future. No, I'm playing. <laughs> I'm right. bad at slow jamming. I'm sorry. No, that's pretty good. Oh, Thank that wasn't you. bad. Um, we're going to open it up to Q&A. And if you guys have any questions, if you can go to one of the two standing mics, because we're recording this for you, too. Hi. <clears throat> Howdy. Hi, my name is uh, Jesus. I'm an engineer. Uh, you started around 92 with the roots, uh, a time where like mostly uh, you should go through a, through a record company to get your album out there. Nowadays, uh, any kiddo can buy like $3,000 computer, have a studio at home, and then like release an album. What is your point of view from an area of like a time era where you had to like get put out there to a time era that there is so much out there that it's very difficult to find things? It's, it's funny you say that, because um, a friend of mine, a fellow Philadelphian uh, rapper, Meek Mills, 
uh, who's down with uh, Rick Ross, just released his uh, mixtape yesterday. Um, 2.5 million downloads in one day, which, you know, in layman's terms, he just went almost triple platinum in a 24-hour period. So it's, it's kind of hard to determine. I know, like, RIAA sales determine what success is. Like, okay, well, 500,000 people purchased this, then you get a gold plaque. But, you know, what does that say about the 3 million people that now have his music? as well, um, which, you know, I know that the RIAA and a few artists are arguing that, well, you know, that's doing a disservice to the industry because the artists aren't getting paid. But, you know, I'm almost certain that if he's able to go triple platinum in a 24-hour period, then that means that if he were to do a show or a concert uh, in the next week or so, it would instantly sell out or he could do a bigger venue and somehow, like, that to me is like the monetary reward that he would get probably more than, like, I've never depended on record sales for any type of money. Like, a lot of my money is, is based on everything but making records. Like, I consider making records sort of like that person outside the club that hands you flyers at the end of the night to let you know when another club is open or, you know, who's there next week. Like, that's what I use records for. Um, so, I mean, yeah, the industry has changed um, whether or not the RIAA continued its mission, especially with the, you know, with the SOPA controversy. Um, like, it, it remains to be seen. But, you know, I, th I think that there's going to have to be a, a changing of the guards and you know, the recording industry of America is holding on to dear life, you know, and it's so obvious that a new system has to start. Uh, if you tweet a link to the album and it has, he has a PayPal, I'm sure I could, like if I like the music, I would put some money there too, so. He's rich enough. <laughs> <laughs> What's up? Um, hi. Um, oh, my turn? wow, you guys are good, that was like magic. <laughs> Hi, um, I used to live in Philly, um, and so I was hoping you could talk about some of your favorite Philly restaurants, um, yeah. um, and just favorite restaurants in general. And also, I work at Zagat up on the ninth floor, and you oh, can nice. by later. And oh, okay. <laughs> there. What part <laughs> of Philly? Google Plus Hangout. Um, I lived in Northern Liberties. Ah, that's where I live. Well, that's where my home is, my current home yeah, is Yeah, I saw you at Honey's once, actually, at brunch. Stop <laughs> <Talk to> me. <laughs> uh, I'll be honest with you. Um, close yours, Daryl. I chose my house because it was in walking distance to Honey's. I love Honey's. I love Honey's. That's a good reason to choose to live in that Yeah. Um, no, actually, um, uh, Philadelphia is probably the, the, the last easily affordable cosmopolitan city in the United States um, in terms of, you know, property and, and resources and, you know, I still, I miss it a lot. I mean, I'm not saying that I'm a 100% New Yorker. But I'll just say that, you know, the last time I was in Philadelphia, it was like a long time ago. But, um, you know, I, I, I like that area of Northern Liberties because it's, it's like our version of uh, maybe Williamsburg. Uh, yeah. You know, a lot of like mom and pop. Well, what would you call a mom and pop store that's not a mom and pop store? Like mom and pop makes it sound so country like it's. It's just a lot of non-corporate businesses. There. Local. Local. There you go. That's, that's what I was searching for. Uh, there's a lot of local restaurants. So that whole area. Yeah, I love it. And I'll keep that house forever. Cool. Come to Zagat. Okay. <laughs> What's up, Quest? My name is Jelani, and I'm a tech consultant here, and also a longtime OK player. Oh, wow. And so um, I was thinking back to what you said earlier about um, when The Roots came out. Uh, you know, I remember back to Do You Want More and mm -hmm. just thinking about how things have changed now. And you said you felt like it might be a little easier for people with the Internet to get their message out. But I wonder if it's um, 
if you think it's also more challenging just because there's so much material and the number of videos. Yeah, my manager upload. told me that um, he had a precise number that there are in existence, I think right now, there's, there's a site in which you actually know the amount of unique MP3s that are on as far as songs on the internet. And the, the number was close to, I think he said like 17 million unique songs created on the internet of which only 29%, like a very small percent even gets heard. You know, like a lot gets created, put on the internet, and no downloads whatsoever. Um, yeah, I think that the, the, the floodgates um, and sort of the overabundance of information, that sort of makes it harder to, like there's, there's so much information out there as far as music is concerned and you know, it becomes overwhelming. Like there's a, there's a record store that I shop at in Pittsburgh called Jerry's. Um, you literally, you, you have to plan a, a four day trek out there because, you know, I, I'll start at 10 and when I go there, I go to like 10 in the morning. By the time he closes at eight, I might get to the letter C. Like that's how large, it's like the largest warehouse of records ever. So, um, I mean, it's problematic, which is why you sort of have to supplement what you do with, with other forms to promote, you know, what you do. So, just one quick follow up also. Sure. Can you talk a little bit about how your own website has helped launch a few careers? Like, I remember Little Brother and, you know, Tanya Morgan and et cetera. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, the whole idea of OK Player was to just, I guess, provide a, a playground um, for, like, my, I, wanted to, I wanted to just talk music with a bunch of people that I felt spoke my language. Um, and so, you know, of course, under the guise of the Roots albums, then, you know, I figured that's where our fan base was. And then after about a year or so of, of getting through that whole awkwardness, is this really you, Quest? Now, you know, two years into it, they felt like they knew me and then we could, like some of those guys, I really consider like, you know, I'm I'm the student and they're the teachers. You know, there's at least five or six guys on there to whom um, they're like my cabinet members, even with like walk-on songs for Fallon. They're the ones, you know, why don't you try this one? Why don't you try this one? You know, like um, that that site's very necessary. It's like it's like a music geeks uh, haven. I mean, some of them are shock posters, of course. You know, it's like, well, you know, Princess Cena's heyday, that, like 1992, after that, you know, like they'll do shock posting. But for the most part, um, it's still, to me, a, a very credible source of, it's like, it's like a nice pitchfork. <laughs> Sorry, pitchfork. Hey, Quest, uh, I'm again a huge fan of yours. Going Thank way you. back, I'm old enough to be like organic style, but have followed you through, uh, you know, Betty Wright and Philadelphia Experiment and oh, thanks. Soul Power Mixtape, all that good stuff. Um, I can remember when the Roots first were really getting a buzz, I, I was happy because I thought, you know, hip hop was going to all of a sudden go in this more instrumental, musical direction. And, you know, y'all are obviously ubiquitous <laughs> and have, you know, changed the industry as much as it would be possible to do. But I wondered whether you thought uh, towards the future, you know, not now, you got a lot of stuff going on, but towards like education, because I've been exposed to a lot of music from being a fan of yours and following mm -hmm. you. And, and I think that you've got a lot of uh, steam behind you to, to encourage people to broaden their musical horizons and take a more historical view. Yeah, I thought that we would spawn, and I think that speculation was like, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll spawn a lot of bands. Um, not the case, I think mostly because, um, again, with us being like the last band that was allowed, not even allowed, I, I, I mean, I'll, I, I guess I can be, be honest. Um, because, because of the bidding war situation that we were in, with our record label, um, we negotiate, instead of like, you know, a lot of people like, when they're in a bidding war, when like labels are fighting over each other, um, mostly people go for the money. 
and my managers and lawyers decided to go for the longevity. So because, because music was so disposable at the time, whereas like, okay, you're only good for your one hit and then later for you, um, they organized it so that we could never get dropped for a long period of time. Like, cause really, there's really no reason, like if you look at it, I mean, we've had two, well, I mean, and we had two very, we have four slow gold records, but I mean, most people see it as, okay, things fall apart in phrenology, our, our fourth and fifth album as like our success story. Um, but there's really no reason why a group with like not one dance hit, like we never had like a hip hop jam has lasted for 20 years this long with 15 albums under its belt, you know, surpassing the time timeline of people that I consider like, you know, like major hip hop contributors. Um, like there's just no logical reason for us to have been here. A big part of it was that the way our contract was built, artist development was a very important thing. And that's, that's the problem with the industry now. Like they don't believe in the long run of, okay, We'll, we'll place you here now, and then maybe by album number five, you know, you'll have a following. They don't believe in that. It's, it's, it's very disposable. We need it now. We need it quick, fast, and hurry. Just add water. Poof. Uh, no, see you later. Goodbye. And then they dispose of you. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful that my management and my lawyers uh, orchestrated it so that, you know, if we made album number one, we had to have made two, three, and four. And then if we got to album number five, we were forced to do six, seven, and eight. And then if we made it to album number nine, 10, 11, 12. I mean, now we're golden, but back then they would have easily dropped us before things fall apart, you know, before we became realized. So what's the lesson here at Questlove? Everybody needs a good lawyer is the lesson. <laughs> Important words for I, all I, just, of you. I said I was a lawyer, right? Yeah, he is a lawyer. <laughs> Every, everyone's a lawyer. a lawyer. Everybody's a lawyer. Everybody, yeah. Even the custodian clues, like, yeah, we're lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we have time for one more quick question. I don't care if I miss rehearsal. Go ahead. All right, then we have time for two. I'm I only playing NBC. Go <laughs> hey, Quest, my name is Brian. Uh, I do music research for YouTube. Uh, I just had and a question. And you're a lawyer? No. Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> So I just had a question just about, you know, the artists that you've worked with over the years, like in particular, like the uh, Soulquarians, like just working with JD mm -hmm. in particular, um, I'm a huge fan of his. And Thanks. so, um, and I really hope you get that entire lot. That'd be amazing. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, just about the creative process and just, you know, interacting with the guys and really, you know, getting into the nuts and bolts and really um, meshing things out. Well, see, I don't want to be like the per Everyone has their, their side of the story of how it happened. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just say that I'm probably the, the, the member of my group, along with my manager, Richard Nichols. Like we, we tend to see the scientific method of how things work. And, um, you know, in the beginning, we were head scratching because we thought like, okay, well, we're, we're something new. Uh, and it wasn't just enough to be like, you know, cause we would get a lot of, oh, I like you guys, but I don't like rap, but I like you guys. Or I hate Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg. That's why I like you guys. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't want to be the person that, that's like just liking a girl cause she's beautiful. But then, like, okay, once age catches on, when she's 15, then you're done with her because you have nothing else in common. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't want to start your relationship with someone just because they hate the status quo. Um, so we were kind of head scratching on why we really weren't catching on in that particular marketplace. Um, I mean, a big part of it had to do with the fact that with Dr. Dre's The Chronic, you know, that was the first time a credible hip hop artist actually created product that sold in the millions, as opposed to, you know, like the, the platinum, multi-platinum success of hip hop had to do with artists that you were like, eh, well, they're not as good as Rakim, or, you know, like this was, this was like The Chronic was the first credible album that had massive appeal. Um, and thus, unfortunately, as with most things in hip hop, when something has mass appeal, then everything else has to clone it, and then it gets oversaturated. 
Um, so we were kind of the odd, we were the odd man out. Even though we made that caboose, we kind of missed the front of the train, of which would have been De La Soul, the Jungle Brothers, the Tribe Called Quest, Arrested Development. Like it kind of closed with diggable planets. And so we just narrowly made it to that, that caboose uh, that left the station. And after our third album, Philadelphia Half Life, um, we were kind of fearing because album number four was coming up. And you already know our contract structure. Mm -hmm. If we didn't make it happen by album number four, then we might not get number five. So we had to make something happen. And um, because we were on a label swimming in money from the legacy of Nirvana and Guns N' Roses and, and Aerosmith, we were on Geffen Records, um, we did a presentation. And we told them that nobody has success in music unless it's contextualized. Um, with another product. So in other words, if you look at Motown, there's Stevie Wonder, Dinah Ross and the Supremes, Temptations, Marvin Gaye, like that's a, that's a movement. Even if stuff that you feel indifferent about, like uh, let's say the disco movement, that you can associate, uh, let's take Casablanca Records, like uh, the Village People, the Ritchie Family. I like the Bee Gees, so I don't wanna say like I consider the Bee Gees like throwaway disco, but you get my point. Yeah. That post Saturday night fever thing. Even today, like everyone's grouped, you think of Jiggy music, you think of like, oh, Puffy, Little Kim, Foxy Brown, Jay-Z. So everything is contextualized and sort of in a movement. And the one thing we noticed that we didn't have was a movement. We didn't have anybody. So we told them, in order for you guys, you guys are spending a lot of money on us. In order for you guys to really see the, the monetary results you wanna see, you're, you're gonna to have to invest in the movement. Now, you've already invested six years into us. What do you wanna do? And they, they decided to, in a rare move, bite the bullet. And that was like a, a major $10 million investment. They had to buy Common out of his contract of relativity. Then we, we just pointed the way. All right, get Black Star. So they bought Most Def out of his thing. They brought Talib out of his thing. They gave Dilla his own record label with MCA. We were trying to get Slum Village, but at the time Slum Village signed to Interscope. Um, and then the rest of the people, we either just kidnapped. So <laughs> D'Angelo and I were like two peas in a pod. You know, By that point, I, I had been in my second year of working on Voodoo, which was like a five-year process. So being with D'Angelo pulled in his, his uh, uh, well, his kind of label mate, uh, Erica Badu, and working with her, and then pulling in Bilal. Next thing you know, like we're all just working with each other. So I'll say that at D'Angelo's studio uh, on, on 8th, uh, 8th Avenue, 6th Street, uh, Electric Lady, that was our epicenter from like 1996 to like 2002. Uh, we had that entire building on lockdown, and so it, it was kind of crazy because, you know, we go in in the morning, usually, like, D'Angelo's the type of person that's like, yeah, I'll show up at one o'clock, but you know that means like 8 p.m.? <laughs> <laughs> so after the third week of that, then Common's like, well, you know, I'm, I'm doing my record, so can we, work, can we work together? So Common, who's extremely responsible and so, like, he would come in from nine in the morning and leave around 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. So we work, in the same studio with Common in the morning, and then D'Angelo from 7 p.m. till usually, a, I'll say six in the morning. Yeah. And this happened over and over. And then, you know, once it, it just became like a big giant sleepover, it was like college. Because it wasn't just us working and, okay, what songs are we gonna work on? You come there, and this is the, before the age of YouTube, so a lot of people were sending me video performances of like Al Green in concert and we sit and watch that forever and overanalyze it and then this Prince concert from 82 and then you know I started acquiring my Soul Train collection and you know cut to a year later we have an entire like I was like I was I was I was a walking YouTube like anything that you can search on now for YouTube of old soul clips I had that stuff and 
we would just watch it and watch it and watch it and study it and watch it and analyze it and watch it and watch it and watch it. And then go and create music, eat, and then watch it and watch it and watch it and watch it and watch it. And then eventually, you know, after five years of working, then all of our albums come out. And then the next thing you know, what? The Roots are going platinum? Erica Badu's album comes out. Uh, D'Angelo's album comes out. Common's album comes out. Most in Kuali's, like, it just became a, a, a family vibe. And, and, you know, that's probably one of the best creative moments of, 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 of my career, just like working in that environment. And, you know, it's sometimes, you know, and every day it wasn't a parade. Like some, day, some days we'd have, you know, the, the day that Dilla discovered uh, Mad Lib was one of the funniest moments. Cause I'll say out of all of us, Jay Dilla was like, like he was like our, our guru. Like he, he'll play like he was an underling, like, well, I don't play drums like you and I don't play keyboards like him, but he was, he was like our guru. Like we patterned our whole movement after him. Um, and one day he came in he's like, yo dog, like, I don't know, man. And I was like, what? He's like, yo, this, this album came out last week called Loop Pack. I was like, yeah? He's like, it's a producer named Mad Lib, man. I don't, I don't know. I gotta go back to Detroit. And like he left for it. Like he was really depressed. Like, there's some other guy out there that makes crazy beats crazier than me. And like that's how he works. Like he just works eight hours a day doing beats, doing beats. And so, I mean, eventually they paired up and became friends, but before it was a problem. He just felt like, oh my God, like, threatened. I met my match, you know. So, sorry for this long, drawn out story. Okay. He's enjoying it, but yeah. No, thank um, you. Thank you so much. And thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, I feel like he's been last waiting one? a long time. Yeah, last I'll, one. I'll you're sure? Yes. I don't want to get you in trouble with NBC. Thank you. You good? No, Appreciate it. <laughs> uh, my name is Isaiah. I'm an engineer here. Big time fan. Same thing. Um, thank you. And that also sounds like the life, kind of just chilling, watching soul videos and making music. So that's awesome. But uh, my question's about, uh, basically, you talked about kind of the mixtape culture we've got and also kind of like the retail culture, how those are kind of two separate things. And it's a pretty old conversation to talk about, you know, underground versus mainstream. Mm -hmm. But why is, what is it like from an artist's perspective? Um, like recently you have like Busta signed into MMG, you got Q-Tip signed into good music. Why, is, why do artists feel now that they still have to be parts of these movements when someone like me can sell 2.5 in a day, like why is it that artists still kind of feel drawn to, you know? In, independence is probably the, the scariest thing. Cause even, you know, as, as, as far as monetary terms are concerned, like again, like having a record deal might be still in my top 10. Only because I'm a record collector do I cherish having a record deal. Um, and I enjoy the fact that I've been on the same label for the, for the whole time. So, you know, I, I do have those moments where I look at my catalog and I see the same font for every Roots logo and I'm like, wow, man, this is really incredible. Like I made 15 records, like these are my 15 kids. Um, I can't speak for those other artists, but um, I think for some artists in particular, um, the idea of having a plan B um, is a very frightening option. Like it's almost like getting a needle at the doctor. Like I used to hate, I used to, I still hate getting needles. Mm -hmm. Quick story, I, the last time I was at the dentist was like maybe 20 years ago. <laughs> Seriously. Um, and so, because I had a re really bad Novocaine experience with like a, 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 a student dentist in like 1979 or something. So I stayed away. And of course, you know, you can't last in life 20, 20 years not going to the dentist. Um, and of course, people were like, Amir, you don't understand. Technology has changed. They have these things called butterfly needles. You'll never feel it. And of course, you know, my fear of like, no, no, I don't want to. But of course, like now I can't eat food because my teeth are about to fall out. Of course, I go to the dentist and, you know, I'm like closing my eyes and bracing myself. And I'm like, all right, let me know when it happens. He's like, I already put it in you. No, seriously. 
And then, <laughs> you know, I was like, wait, I never felt it. So it's, it's like the, the, the fear of the unknown sometimes cripples you. And again, because of the time that we came out, we had to do five times the work of the average artist. Like when we came out, people weren't rolling out the red carpet. They weren't welcoming us with open arms. They were like, you guys are corny. Like, <laughs> you're not a real rap group. You don't even have a real DJ. Um, you know, you're doing all this jazz stuff and whatever. Like, they, it took, we, it took us so long to get their respect. Um, and once an audience did embrace us who wasn't the prime hip hop audience, we had to learn how to entertain them. That said, I'll say that having a plan B, like I've done everything under the, I know this is negative to say, but sort of under the assumption that this is not gonna work, so let me do something else. You know, even this Fallon gig, you know, people are like, oh man, you guys finally got the exposure you want. You know what I'm thinking about? Conan O'Brien. <laughs> no, because Conan, Conan, Conan was still shooting a show across the hall the first year, and you know, I saw everything, the whole staff, and yeah, so you guys excited for California? Oh my God, I can't wait, I just sold my house. It was so risky, but you know, Conan all talked to us, took us all out to dinner, I just sold my house, and I can't wait to go to California. It's gonna be exciting. You know, cut to nine months later, right. And that's like my worst nightmare. Now, a person like me, I'm always having a plan E, plan F, plan G. Like I never plan on anything being final. So that said, and again, I'm sorry for the long drawn out explanation. I just think that, you know, that some artists are just set in their ways and don't have another option. You know, if this falls, I could teach. I got a few college offers. I, I can teach somewhere. If this falls, maybe I can become, you know, the, the new face of food trucks. It'll, it'll be a little sad and ironic. <laughs> 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 you know, and I, I, you know, the irony is not falling on me that, wow, I could actually be, you know, a mega millionaire off of something that I never- The George never... Foreman grill kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, like, oh my God, like, this is going to be my legacy? Um, <laughs> But I'm not afraid, and I think that people who aren't afraid to, to explore and see what's out there, those are the people that are gonna swim, you know? But I, I wish those guys luck with their endeavors, but, you know, um, as an artist today, I, you know, they always ask, like, what advice do you have for me? My new advice is always have a plan B. Well, it seems like a good note to end on. Questlove, thank you. Thank you. So much. Appreciate it.